by music companies now because um, uh, uh, trying to find places where juries are more likely to look at for plaintiffs. What you do is they incorporate in those locations and thereby gain standing to be able to bring those suits to those locations, even though those locations have no connection to the patentee, to the technologies, to the witnesses, to the evidence, to anything. So one of the things that we would like to see happen in this legislation, what's in the bill now is good, but not good enough, to address that issue of incorporation of convenience to prevent parties from being able to bring their suits where they think they're most likely to win, but to actually bring their suits where the witnesses, the evidence, and the parties are. Thank you. You're welcome. Is that clear enough? Yes. I can't be clear about the intentions. <laughs> so post-grant opposition. And that, that's a good point. We to, we'll go into that a little more. Post grant opposition is something that is proposed in both pieces of legislation, and that is, uh, I would say that it's a it's a pushback on the quality issue. What's happened right now is very expensive to litigate a patent to go to court to prove it's in, that it's uh, not valid, that it doesn't meet the test. The uh, 1.5 million dollars and up to litigate a patent in the United States to go back and show that in fact you, the, the patent's no good in the first place. So what's being proposed is a post-grant opposition process by which you can uh, go to the USPTO and say, can you review this patent and re review its validity? Now, this has several issues within it, one of which people will talk about called second window. Um, but I think one of the key elements that we need to ask, and, I, and I'll actually leave with either Matt or memory because this one's kind of a direct review in the, in the negative in that sense, what do you do with the fact that the second window proposal, uh, I'm sorry, the second window proposal and the, and the uh, uh, post grant opposition proposal in the Senate bill has been referred to by, by uh, Director Duda says, quote, uh, it will overwhelm the USPTO and that we have no capability essentially to handle the proposed, uh, the, the proposal as it stands in the legislation right now. Who do they need to hire? Is, is Duda, even though he used to be one of us, is he right? Is he wrong? Do you think that's fixing that? It, it seemed to me to be an awful strange comment coming from him because the PTO had actually suggested a second window post grant review process. Um, so I'm not quite sure how they can, in one sense, propose it and then um, say they can't do it. Um, I think there would be uh, challenges and they would be up to that task. Um, I think the question of the second window is very basic. There are a lot of bad patents out there. When you get sued, you ought to have a chance to get a fair shake, not end up in Marshall, Texas, where I have to meet the standard of having a child taken away from his family in order to overturn this bad patent. Um, we're in search of finding something that is both fair. Um, we believe that having the PTO, the expert, look at this technical patent, whether it's a microchip or a pharmaceutical formula or something like that, um, that not having the judge do it, having the PTO do it is the right thing to do. Um, I, we have tried to um, be clear all along that we want a quick process, whatever it is. This is not a point to try and hold up litigation. Um, we just want a fair shake and make sure that ultimately we don't get sued with a bad patent. Uh, that everybody here, or most people here, have a Blackberry or some similar device. The RIM case is the perfect example of that. Um, there is currently a process for trying to get your patent, a patent in litigation reviewed by the PTO. RIM tried to do that, um, but by the time the PTO um, got around to invalidating the patents that uh, RIM had been sued on, RIM had already been forced to settle this case for $612 million. So what you have is a system where you have a $612 million settlement based on what turned out to be bad patents, because the system for reviewing re-examining patent didn't work right. That's why Congress has to step in. To go to, to, to the point about the Supreme Court, that's something the Supreme Court's not going to deal with. They can't set up a system at PTO to review a patent. Um, and so that is something that Congress must do. If we're going to have a fair shake, um, it, it has to be that way. And the, one other point on that, the, one of the criticisms, in addition to the dues criticism, is that this creates an ability to challenge a, a patent at any time in the process. And I just don't think that's true. The bills were written in a way, and the incentive bill has been even uh, drawn even tighter to make sure that when a, a second window or whatever sort of review process of that patent is not open to anybody who wants to challenge a company and cause them problems. It's only if you get sued 
then you have the right to say, I'd like to have that patent reviewed by, by the PTO. So you'd argue that the, sec that the, the post grant opposition process is an answer to the crisis of quality that we're seeing out of the PTO, and it, it's, a, it's a chance to do a lower it, cost. It's, it's, a lower one cost. Of the, it's one of the answers. Right. It, it certainly isn't the only answer, but it is one of the answers. So that sounds fairly logical, Chris and Amy. What, what are your problems with the post grant opposition process and the second window, this, this uh, extended opportunity? As a way to ensure quality. Which is right. what you're saying. Yes. Uh, the fact of the matter is the way to ensure quality is to get it right the first time. And it's to do anything on a pre-grant basis <clears throat> that will enhance that possibility. All of those measures, we favor third-party input uh, and, and all of the rest that, that will allow them to make the right decision. We're in favor of uh, getting rid of, on a permanent basis, fee diversion. And we're in favor of beefing up the procedures as well as the uh, numbers. Uh, in the patent office, and we think that uh, Judas has done a pretty good job at, at uh, working with what he's got. Now, to turn to the post grant issue, if you do not have quiet title in the patent that you have acquired, uh, then when you as what's quiet title? Quiet title means that that you can go to a venture capitalist and say I got a patent, and you can count on it. If you go to the venture capitalist and say I've got a patent, say yeah, but how do we know it isn't going to be? Uh, um, subject to opposition and all the rest of these issues, uh, then you don't. And you can't raise the venture capital uh, that you need to do the business that you're in. These companies uh, that Emory represents don't have that issue, but we do. And, and we, if we can't get venture capital, uh, we can't function. So, so that's a critical, that uncertainty of a right to not just challenge, but to cancel a patent. And that's the language of the statute. Uh, Any time during its life, uh, means that that patent is not reliable. So the second window that enables that uh, is is absolutely uh, contrary to the strength and process that's required to have innovation. Well, I think you have a point about just, just, quality, just, just hold on a second. So this quiet title business. So it, it, it's, it's really not right, and you know it. So under current law, there are at least four or five or six different ways you can challenge a patent through its entire life. Challenge it in court. You can challenge it under inter-parties re-exam, ex-party re-exam. You can challenge it under interference practice. You can challenge it a whole bunch of different ways. So this notion that somehow under today's law, patents are immune from challenging after one year after they're granted, and that this change that we are proposing, that others are proposing the law, would have a dramatic, unquieting, disquieting, property destructive, it's just not true. Well, if they're all there, why do you want more? Because the, 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 the only one of those that is truly effective is the old code court. That's really expensive and time consuming. The other methods currently available, PTO itself by its own admission, has told us doesn't work. They have filed a force that effect before Congress three times in the last five years. They have recommended post grant as a way to create an effective system. And your opposition really is not to better quality, it's your opposition is really to better quality through an effective administrative challenging system. We think administrative challenges are good things. They save time, they save money, they bring out that tax. So you gotta be careful about these quiet title arguments because there is no such thing as quiet title. There are ineffective means now in the system and your real objection is to an effective means of challenging that. Now I really don't have to say things here because Emory makes my cases for me and tells me what I'm saying. I'll say what I'm saying and why don't you say what your views are. My view is this, that uh, in Europe uh, these uh, proceedings take up to five years. My technology is often obsolete within five years. So if I can be delayed by anyone, anytime, on a seriatim basis, by having one of these procedures raised at the PTO, it's going to sap up my money and take up all my time. I can be severely harmed. Now, would folks do that? Would they gang up and do it? Would dinosaurs say, gee, I see the ice age coming, I'm going to delay it for 100 years? You bet they would. And we're talking about creative destruction, what makes capitalism work. This is Joseph Schumpeter, you all know about that. And we're talking about disruptive technology, not with other big guys. We've got cross licensing with them. It's with little guys, universities, that kind of technology coming through the pipeline. They want to be able to stall it. They want to be able to hold it up. They want additional proceedings than the ones they now have. And uh, we think that that's overkill. And we think that the impact on our stage of innovation is deadly. And in fact, it's not Microsoft that goes out of business if that happens. It's we go out of business. There's 
We can't raise venture capital. We can't function. And you have something quick because we're going to go to Q&A. Yeah, just very quickly. I mean, I think this, this issue, as with the damages issue, we just have to tread very carefully and make sure that it really is crafted in such a way that it doesn't negatively affect some of the stakeholders, whether it's small or large, um, and that it has a purpose to make sure that people that patent, um, people that are owning patents um, will not be harassed and, and delayed um, through a new administrative procedure. And I know there's work in this area being done on the bill, and so I, I urge um, members to continue to work to improve it. All right, and then that one, before we go to Q&A, just one quick thing that that I think is at least playing devil's advocate is an interesting issue, and that is uh, an enhanced rulemaking authority for the PTO. Uh, what I, I would be devil's advocate for a moment and, and point out that you all want to have oversight over agencies, and this bill may, in fact, grant more power to the PTO to make more of their own decisions. Um, there's a lot of arguments to say that's a good thing, that, that Congress maybe doesn't need to weigh in on every patent issue, but there are certainly some, some open questions. So as you think about the issues and you have questions, that's one that's clearly in the purview of members of Congress's mind. So with that Q&A, first question. Uh, yes, uh, I wasn't able to tease this out of the discussion, but I was hoping the panelists could speak to what are the concerns that may be more specific to the IT sector as opposed to other sectors. I suspect there is a prevalence towards cross-linking in terms of the business model of the IT sector as opposed to others, but nowhere near as expert in the field as they are. Matt, you want to start down with your last question? Yeah. Um, th there are some differences among industries. Um, a lot of that has to do with our products. Mm -hmm. um, Cisco router could have a thousand or more patented or, or individual inventive contributions to that product. It makes for a very different analysis than, say, a a, a, a pharmaceutical product that may have one or two patents in it. Um, so, well, they don't really have to worry about what happens if I get sued on the really small patent that has nothing to do with the value of the product. The suit against me almost inevitably is the one that is the unimportant uh, piece of the fat. You know, it's not the three patents in that router that are core to the value of that router. It's the add-in card that is only used in 1% of the routers, and even then, once it's installed, it's hardly used. That's the patent I get sued on. So there are differences in our products that create different uh, views of, of the process. Um, but I think the patent system is built to apply to everybody equally. And so that creates a challenge. And that's why all this is going on, to find that balance. Just to comment, I agree with, with Matt. There will certainly will be cases where an apportionment approach is the right approach to take and will result in what would have been agreed upon if the parties had engaged in negotiations, which is what they're trying to do. But to say that should be applied in all cases is what runs into the problem that he raised, which is there's different business models operating here. We can't just have one formula for everybody. Next. One size doesn't fit all. Well, my question kind of builds off of that. Right now in current law, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, aren't there 15 different ways that the courts, tools basically, that the courts can use to figure out what's the appropriate damages in a certain case? What's the benefit of getting rid of 14 of them and only staying with one? Amy? Hey, we have to agree with that. I mean, we think that the Georgia-Pacific case, which is the standard there, is a very robust case. Um, you know, obviously there, there are some, some areas where people um, may have issues with how it's concerned, but I think on balance, it's, it's been very fair. So, uh, we would agree with your assessment. So, so, let's do a little bit of, uh, of analysis and, and numbers. So, since George Pacific was decided, um, over 480 cases have decided George, George Pacific in doing their uh, damage calculations. George Pacific is just a laundry list. It's a laundry list of you know, we can do things any number of ways. It does not provide any real guidance to courts about how to get apportionment or entire market value of any other way. And uh, 28 appellate courts, or 28 cases have been appealed and decided by appellate courts. The pattern out of those 480 cases plus the 28 cases is kind of interesting. The Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit standard for overruling damages award by a quarter jury 
is monstrously excessive. So in order for an appellate court to say the jury came up with the wrong number, it's got to decide that the number they came up with is monstrously excessive. It's a pretty high standard. So you've had very little by way of checks and balances to the appellate process in the application of Georgia decision. Finally, what we have is all 15 of those Georgia factors are generally presented to juries. So if you want to pull out for you if you're curious, jury instructions out of any recent case where damages were being decided. And those jury instructions will run anywhere from 30 to 80 pages. And what they will do is give the jury the choice to pick between all those variables. Juries are made up of lay people who don't know a whole lot about integrated circuits and practices and how much other products are going to. So the chances of getting those damage calculations wrong are very high. What the statute does, what the bill does, is provide clarity and guidance to ensure that fairness results, not any kind of a dark board shot at 15 choices, and you pick your choice. Well, any, the next question? Okay. So building off of that, you said that the current bill is just a portion of damages, so maybe not have 15 different ways, but do you think that maybe we really should have three or four different choices rather than just the portion of one? Actually, the bill has all those choices. So oh, the, bill, okay. the bill does, does three things. It says, um, in deciding what a reasonable royalty is, courts have to figure out what a fair share, fair return is, based upon the value of the invention. Second thing the bill says is, if the reason why people are buying that product is because of that invention, then you value it on the entire price of the invention. So when you take, uh, I don't know, cholesterol drug, obligatory, the reason why we buy that drug is not because of the binders and buffers and food coloring in the bill, but because of the chemical compound that hopefully will reduce my cholesterol. In that case, you get the value based on the value of the entire bill. And then the third provision of the bill says the following, which is specific to the TI and Agroway licensing issues. It says, if there is a licensing history, you look at the licensing history, and if none of these things that we have called out specifically work for you, then you can use any other factors that have come out of jurisprudence or uh, court decisions, i.e. the rest of the Georgia-Pacific factors. So it preserves Georgia-Pacific. It simply highlights guidance points for how juries should be directed to deal with the uh, damages cases. On the issue of damages, there is a wonderful uh, summary of all of that in, in a paper written by a man named Rutt Lynch, which I will uh, give to anyone who gives me their card, and is cited in the Judge Michelle uh, arguments about uh, why this won't work. So I think you have to read the, the section yourself, draw your own conclusions. I don't see it the way he does, uh, but um, maybe you will. Yeah, I, I would just say, in, in terms of the, the language that's in the bill now, at least the way our time council reads it, it looks like you always apply a portion, and then you like run through the filters, and the very last thing you get to is other factors, and including market fit licensing. So um, that's that's a huge concern for us. Next question. Uh, Emory described our existing patent system, I think, correctly, as a unified system that applies across the board to all patents and all fields of technology, and Matt uh, echoed that by saying it's a one-size-fits-all system. And I'm wondering whether it's time for us to re-examine that. Uh, maybe in, you know, in the 21st century, uh, a single unified patent system doesn't fit all, all fields of technology, all industries. Uh, the, the descriptions that we've had between you know, uh, setting IT apart from pharma, for instance, I think are very accurate. And I think that the, uh, the concerns of the various industries are all real and uh, genuine concerns. Uh, should we start making some accommodation for the different nature of the patents, the different nature of the technologies that are involved? I would say that sets us down a very dangerous road because how are we going to know what some of the industries are coming you know, in the future? How are we going to set that up? And I'd also just point out that TI is in the very same industry sector as Intel and some other folks in the, in the Coalition for Patent Fairness, and we have very different views um, on this and the way that we use our patents. So we, we would like to stay with the very system. What about the nature of the patents, whether they're being worked? being licensed or being used for strategic purposes by uh, patent trolls. Again, how are you going to determine, you know, what's, what's the standard? And I'd actually, I uh, will switch on the question. I mean, you heard that term, patent trolls. Um, I, I will admit that I, I think it's like pornography in the sense the Supreme Court once said, you know when you see it, but it's really hard to define. So I, I'd caution anyone from 
throwing that term out there. It's uh, particularly hard to find, and you might find that there's folks in your district that somebody might call a patent troll, and somebody else may call a small innovative business. So they definitely exist, they're just hard to identify. To that point, though, the, the, the courts have recently uh, taken that into account, the nature of the case and the way it's been brought. There's a case called Eonet v. Flagstar, U.S. Federal Circuit, 2007, uh, where they actually applied sanction to the law firm that brought the case. So the courts know how to deal with abusive litigation. And don't get the impression that abuse is one-sided here. If you can imagine that there's no abuse on the other side, you're living in a dream. Well, of course, there's abuse on all sides. Forgive me if this isn't quite in the form of a proper question, but I have some thoughts and maybe you just respond to them with your thoughts. Who are you, you directing to? I guess the whole group. Okay. Um, patent trolls were just mentioned, so I guess my, my related thought to that has been sort of the idea of the patents. Uh, I've heard a lot of allegations that patents are sometimes fought up for the sake of um, sequestering an idea from development. And in particular, I've heard this allegated of the uh, auto industry, where there might be some greener technologies which are patented, and the patents are bought up by the larger auto companies that have to compete with these things, so they don't have to worry about um, new ideas being uh, intrusions into the marketplace. And uh, I've also sort of been wondering to what extent, you could have very different opinions on some very important things, but you're all from industry. <coughs> and we've, you've described the, the purpose of patents as fostering innovation and good public benefit. And um, I'm a scientist, I have a science PhD. When I was doing that, I took some law classes in, in patents. So I'm, I'm by no means an expert, you all know far more than me. But I was sort of exposed to the idea of a patent system and all intellectual property law as existing to foster a, a grander public domain. So the patents exist only so that they will eventually expire and these lend to the public domain. And when it comes to IT in particular, the, the time period over which things expire is so much longer than the period where the technology is relevant. So I'm sort of curious, I guess I have two questions here, which is how do you see the, the opinions that you have have been small business versus large business. And you mentioned that as, as the, the, the uh, all the views are sort of the small business large business views. But I think that there are um, maybe this, this other set of people out there who aren't in the businesses at all, who could benefit from different kinds of reform, either to um, the, the time span or to laws that might take into account um, patents that are being bought up by trolls or whatever you call them to, to make sure patents don't get developed in addition to selling them and buying patents. So this is sort of a nebulous set of problems, and I'm still going to get to the better from the question, but I don't think I work for that. Well, I think when you look at you know, what's the public benefit, um, and to go to, to, to Morgan's point about you know, troll when you see it, the, the company or the organization that created the Shell Corporation that sued me with a patent that they obtained from another company that they sued, that I can't even figure out who actually owns it, I'm pretty sure that's a troll. I'm not, I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty sure. We, didn't, we haven't found them under any bridges, we haven't found them at all, um, who actually is behind these multiple Shell Corporations. Um, but for the public benefit, what's the public benefit of a, a company obtaining a patent and doing nothing with it other than suing other companies? The patents that I hold are for the purpose of protecting my intellectual property, which I use to hire tens of thousands of engineers in the United States, spend billions of dollars in the United States on R&D, and, pro and produce products which are, you know, change the world. You said um, that in the form of a question. I think, I, I think it was rhetorical, but I do have an answer. The purpose of that patent, I would think, isn't to reward anyone in the short term. It's to make it so that it's not a trade secret. I mean, it's to enrich the public domain because when that, when that patent is right. it will come public. No, uh, that, is, that, is, that is one of the two key elements. And when you come to the expansion of prior use, that becomes what this bill could possibly be construed as. No Thank question you. about yes. that. No yes. question about it. And that's one of the concerns that we have. So, so the, the two kind of problems of the public interest here are one scientific progress, right, which is your problem, which is dissemination of this information. A precondition for a patent is that you fully disclose your invention, which then lets others build upon it, not necessarily by making the same product or invention, but building upon the science. The, the second purpose of the patent law is actually to bring useful new products to the market. So one of the preconditions for patentability is the utility requirement. So it's built into the law. So we benefit as individuals, as citizens, two ways. One, we get smarter, and new scientists get to use more information. But the second one is we get better stuff to use that improves our lives. For that second problem, to bring those products to market, we need to get specific to the patent law, because that is what creates commercial opportunity. 
and uh, I mean, uh, usually from these panels, and argue with drug companies, but also become the drug companies. Now. So it takes drug companies anywhere from 10 to 12 years to bring a product to market. It's the reality of their business. By the time they actually bring a product to market, and they've done all that research, they have a very short period of time which is to their profits. I want a new Alzheimer's drug on the market. I want the new cardiovascular drug on the market. I want all those things to happen. And the only way to create incentives for companies to make that investment is to provide them some chance for financial reward. So I think your assumption is right, which is the comments, the dissemination information is a critical well with the patent law. It is not the only one. But the second one is a great benefit to us from better profits. Next question. Um, I noted earlier that none of the panelists <coughs> had a problem with the 18-month uh, publication uh, yeah. on the bill. I just happened to be. Uh, Turned to a page in roll call today where oh, yeah. the U.S. Business and Industry Council is specifically opposing that provision and saying that it will help, it'll help China steal. Yeah. China no, and I'll take that one. So, yeah, I'll, I I'll take that one. I, I'm sorry that, that certain people have this sense of that, but the reality of the world is, and we've testified this before for the Judiciary Committee on this issue, companies nowadays don't sell products only in the United States realistically. You get them made elsewhere, uh, other places. You sell them other places. It's a global marketplace whether you agree with Thomas Friedman's book or not. And yet a company who testified before that, before the House Judiciary Committee, very clearly had a product here in the United States, had a patent in the United States, couldn't afford to file a patent in Germany, went to the big CBIT show, he did scanner technology, went to the big CBIT show and there was a booth right next to him with someone demonstrating their patented technology. The response from his U.S. Patent Council, Unless they ship to the United States, there's nothing you can do. So I'm sorry that there are people who are creating worldly toothbrushes who are concerned about the, about their, their giving away secrets to China. The reality is we're already giving all of our secrets away to China. The best thing to do is to do harmonization that gets us to the point where we can actually go into China and say, look, I've got a patent here in China, pay up. But until, until we get some level of harmonization, we have to do, we, we, we're going to be constantly blocked by the rest of the global marketplace. So I respect their views. I respect some of the folks who are out there in the independent inventor community. There are others who are funding it who I do not believe are, in fact, truly independent inventors. But the reality is, is that it's a global marketplace. And just, you know, we're going to have to, we're gonna have to welcome in the 21st century. There is a book called 18 Months Plus One Nanosecond, which describes this phenomenon. Of, of grabbing off of these patents. The, the, the issue of unilateral harmonization through legislation rather than through trade agreements is a real issue. And, and perhaps we ought to be doing it that way instead of doing it here because they will, uh, as, as has been said, they will take advantage of any edge they can. I can tell you that, that my people tell me that when they go to China, and they're in China a lot, the Chinese are saying, I can't believe you guys are weakening patents and making them less enforceable and making them harder to get. Why, why would you be doing that? Uh, that's what you've been telling us not to do. So uh, th 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 there are some real questions about harmonization and what it means. I, I mean, having actually lived and worked in China for several years doing that, I can, uh, I can speak to that at greater length if you want to talk about it. But I'm, now I'm taking over my podium space. So any other questions? With that, I'd like to thank Tim Lorden from the Internet Caucus, uh, uh, Mr. Goodlock, Congressman Goodlock, who 